to begin and by telling you a little bit about how long I've known Monty for, which I think is 10 or 12 years now. I can't even remember exactly the first time we met. But um, Monty at the time was a reporter for the Associated Press. And I used to always look forward to seeing him because we would always have these long, involved discussions about how much we appreciated society and culture in Israel and how drawn I was to it. Obviously, Mati was because he made Aliyah from the time that he was 18. Um, and there's a really beautiful line in Pumpkin Flowers when Mati is describing Avi, who's a soldier who you, who you live with through the first part of the book. And he says that Avi um, is one of those people who became an individual early. And I think I always felt that way about you, Mati, because the idea that you could, so, at such a young age, know, make such an enormous decision, um, and within a year of being in Israel, Mati was um, drafted and uh, went, as those of you know who read the book, went to go serve um, in the security zone. Um, and that's what this book becomes about. I think that knowing Mati and having the pleasure of conversations with him, it's kind of a remarkable thing to read this book because he, it is exactly what he is like. So, Oh, so funny and so warm and so brilliant, but um, also just always this wonderful wry tone that is only in sort of yours. Um, and I felt like when I was reading this book, it was just a continuation of the, those long conversations, just a little, more, even a little more articulate than usual. <laughs> um, so um, for those of you who have anything read, I say now is going to be a yeah, let down be totally after that, so maybe I'll just um, shut up. But. Um, for those of you who haven't yet read it, um, I just can't recommend it enough. I, I really sort of like laughed and cried my way through this book and in the process learned an enormous amount, I feel, about this particular period um, in Israel's history. Um, and my mother is reading it now and said it was a masterpiece. And if she thinks it's a masterpiece, then it probably is because she's my mother. Um, so. I wanted to ask you to, to begin with, um, to talk a little bit about how you found Avi and how you knew that he was going to be the soldier who you would tell the first part of this story through. The, the, the book is an attempt to tell the story of a forgotten but very important war in South Lebanon in the 90s through the story of this one outpost called Outpost Pumpkin. That's really what it was called in Hebrew, Mutzav Dlat. And I knew that my story wasn't enough to tell the story of the outpost. I needed uh, the stories of other soldiers who had served there throughout the time that this outpost was important. And I also needed um, experiences beyond my own experiences in this war to flesh out what I think a war story really needs and the kind of the blows to the gut that a story like this needs to deliver. My experiences are, are just, were just insufficient to do that. So I looked for other stories, and I went around the country interviewing people. Some of them were my friends from the army. Some of them were people I never met. They were friends of friends and people I found in all kinds of different ways. And, um, and eventually I found this, this character, Avi, who had been at Outpost Pumpkin before I arrived there. And he turned out to be just an incredible character. He was a very young person, obviously, when he was there, 19, 20. But he, uh, as you mentioned, he became an individual early. So he was he had this ability to, to stand outside his body and look at himself from a, from a distance. And he was cynical about the army. He didn't really want to be there, but he was there, and he didn't have to be there. And he wrote letters home in which he describes the outpost, and he talks about his, his thoughts about life. He wrote letters, as many of us did, to a girl. In his case, it was a girl named Smadar. And these letters are, are pretty amazing documents. And when I wrote that he became an individual early, I wrote it with a certain amount of jealousy because I don't feel that I was an individual early. I, I think he was. He could see himself from a distance, and he wrote things at age 19 and 20, which it would take most of us you know, many, many years um, to arrive at the same level of, um, you know, to reach the same perspective that he, that he reached so so early, so that's what drew me to him, and his story takes up the first third of the book or so. There's that. Um, there's so many beautiful lines in his letters, but there's that one that really stayed with me, where he says um, to Smadar, "I think about home, my friends, about the love story I haven't started yet." And I think you do this beautiful job of sewing underneath this whole story, which is really a story about um, about war. This very 
fragile understory about what it is to be a person on the cusp of becoming adults and what you imagine your life will be. And for him, as I'm sure it was for, you know, for you, for many, it was this imagination of, of um, who you will fall in love with, like where your sort of life will take you. Um, but I, I, I was curious to know, um, you know, there's so many moments when you're describing Avi's experience and you're describing it presently, which is to say as if we are there with him, um, down to the last detail of, for example, um, he's writing a letter and he hears Bono on the radio and then you describe him and it's so vivid in my mind, I could just see him putting out his cigarette and putting down his pen and sort of sitting back to think. And, and I thought as I was reading this about the ways in which I have sometimes played also with um, what is real, what is fiction and what is reality. And I, I know that this is a piece of journalism, it's a piece of nonfiction, but to what degree do you, do you play with that? To what degree are you inventing or imagining into what is otherwise a historical situation? So the book is nonfiction. So there are no details in it that I invented. Um, the, the detail that you mentioned, for example, where he's writing a letter and he stops writing because the song One comes on the radio and anyone who was of a certain age in the 90s remember that, remembers that song. That song cast a spell for a couple of months. Um, and he heard One and he stops writing. And I know that because he wrote it in the letter. He, he's in the middle of a thought about, if I'm remembering correctly, about moving to Alaska. And he's describing where he's gonna go, you know, as soon as the army releases him from this prison that, um, you know, that he felt he was living in. And, and then he gets interrupted mid-thought, and then the letter starts again, and he, he explains to Smadal that in the middle of this thought, he was interrupted by, by hearing one on the radio. So um, I, I tried to make it as vivid as possible um, with, within the, pretty strict guidelines of, of journalism. So there's no invented dialogue, there are no composite characters. Every detail in the book is based on something. Every um, quote that people remember appears without quotation marks. Um, and anything that's in quotation marks is a quote from a document or from a recording. Um, so I was trying to write a novelistic uh, piece of journalism, but one that kind of adheres to the strictest journalistic standards. There's that one moment where you say, we talk about all these letters that soldiers poured out to women who were friends or lovers or hopeful lovers, and you say, but what can you do? It's not you can go back to these people now and ask for your letters back to sort of find out who you were then. But I thought, well, you did go back to her. Of course, it, weren't your, it wasn't your letters, but you went back and somehow must have found her and found this incredible trove of, of these amazing sensitive letters. Right, I, I had my own letters that I can't get back. That you can't get back? Maybe somebody will send them to you now that you've written this book. Um, so I, I was hoping you would read a little section um, from the book that we talked about, um, which is really t sort of talking about the language that the army gives to quite violent things. Sure, should I just Please, yes. launch into it? Go right into it. The army gave, we're talking about the security zone in South Lebanon in the 90s. The army gave the outposts pretty names like basil, crocus, cypress, and red pepper. And this reflects a floral preoccupation in our military, which in naming things generally avoids names like hellfire or apache in favor of ones like artichoke, a night vision apparatus for tank gunners, or buttercup, an early warning system for incoming mortar shells. In the jargon of army radio men, wounded soldiers are flowers, and dead soldiers are oleanders. It isn't a code because it isn't secret. Instead, the names seem intended to bestow beauty on ugliness and to allow soldiers distance from the things they might have to describe. If you listen to the language of the Lebanon troops, you might have thought they occupied a kind of a garden. The pumpkin was set up three miles due north of Beaufort Castle on a hilltop where nothing significant is known to have happened before the events are counted here or since. The military archives contain no record of the outpost construction, or at least none I could find. In Hebrew, the outpost was called Blat, just pumpkin, not the pumpkin. But I've always thought of it as a place that deserves a definite article in English, and as the pumpkin's first historian in any language, and almost certainly its last, I grant myself license to call it in translation whatever I want. The name now, now seems to hint at the kind of magic at work in the transformation of a bare hilltop into the scene of emotion and drama and its sudden transformation back into a place of no importance at all. I th 
when you say floral preoccupation, I think actually the floral nature sort of is, is an effort to give a sense of innocence to what is sort of the least innocent of things, which is war, and to call um, wounded soldiers flowers and um, dead soldiers cyclamen and all. I think there's something about that that's so, that it, it gives it a lyricism which um, war doesn't really have. Um, not while it's happening, I would imagine, even if later it does. Um, and that made me think a little bit about the section where Avi talks about this little bit of innocence that he has that he tries to hide away because he knows that it can be used against him. And then, of course, throughout the book, I was thinking a lot about that notion of innocence, which you raised, the fact that these are basically children. I mean, over the course of this time, um, you talk about how all of Israeli society begins to think about the soldiers as their own children because of the Four Mothers movement that happened. And um, so sort of this, um, this sense of this innocence, but also uh, this need to be, as a soldier, so tough. And you have these um, a few beautiful moments in the book where you talk about this specifically, um, this fear that in Israel um, we're no longer sufficiently tough you say, is one of the key chemicals in our country's communal brain. And later on, you talk about the debate about crying at funerals, whether it should be allowed, because the real question is really, um, are we still strong enough to survive here? And so it's sort of, I was fascinated with this play between those two things, a sense of sort of like innocence and softness, and this um, sort of classical Israeli notion of manhood, which has to do with being um, militant, tough, unbreakable um, as a response to sort of galut weakness. Um, and yet you've written this book which is manages to somehow straddle the line of both being incredibly sensitive and lyrical, but also describing something with a lot of stoicism too. Um, I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit about that. You're, because you not only straddle, so you straddle two cultures growing up in Toronto and in Canada and, and then sort of becoming Israeli. And I thought maybe you could give us some sense of your perception of all of that. Sure, I mean, I think there's an image of the Israeli, which Israel has always projected or tried to project since its very early years, which is this very masculine image. And there are these you know, famous propaganda pictures of the early pioneers who are these brawny, you know, shirtless guys plowing fields and these, the soldiers and the Six Day War and um, a kind of celebration of manliness and, f and force uh, as a response to you know, the victimization that had characterized Jewish life before. The army that I found when I was drafted in 1997 was not that at all. And the, the brigade that, that I served in, which is called, in Hebrew it's called Nachal, which is a, a, an acronym for Fighting Pioneer Youth. And it's, an, it's a, a unit that has very little um, gung-ho spirit. Um, the, the guys, the, the, the brigade is actually famous, or the name, Nachal, is famous not because of the fighting prowess of the soldiers, but because there's a famous entertainment troupe called the Nachal, La Kata Nachal, the Fighting Pioneer Youth Entertainment Troop. So it's a unit without a reputation for, you know, for valor in, in battle. And the, the brigade's slogan isn't death before dishonor or anything like that. It's the human advantage. That was the unit's official slogan, which could be the exactly. motto of a toothpaste company or like an insurance firm. I'm not sure I know what that means, the human advantage. It, it means, it, it, to me it says something humane. Like it's about the, the people involved. Um, it's not about, you know, fighting prowess, it's about human beings, and, and that characterized this, this unit, and the, the guys who I met, you know, coming, blundering into this thing, basically from, from Toronto, were not at all, um, you know, manly and, and gung-ho. They were middle-class kids um, who were doing this between high school and, and university, and did not plan on getting killed, and would have been happy to go through the whole thing without any you know, particular drama. And they were doing it because they thought, they understood that this is necessary, that your turn comes and this is what you do. But there was no love of military force. Everyone hated the army. If you were gung-ho, you were suspect. That was considered really weird and kind of gauche. You weren't supposed to be into it. If you were into it, there was something wrong with you. And the um, kind of ultimate example of that spirit is Avi who is very much um, 
an example of that. So he's in the army, but he, and he's doing it, and he's in a good unit, and he's doing it because he understands that's necessary, but he hates it. He hates it, and he wants to go home, and he wants to be a civilian, and he wants to live in Tel Aviv, and he wants to you know, be with girls, and he wants to listen to music. Um, so I think a lot of this image, the masculine image, is, is kind of a front or, or a show, and, and I think it's enough to come to Israel and just meet people, and you'll see that it's not really, it's not really the case. So the army ends up being full of, you know, sensitive or unmilitary people. And that's I think, what I find. I think the, that shift part, I mean, there was that notion of manhood for sure in like the generation of, of people who fought in the Pamuk or who fought in the independence war. But I think what's interesting is the way in which over the course of many decades of living in a situation in which you are constantly under existential threat, which creates, as you point out in the book, a kind of thoughtfulness, right? So as soon as you begin to live in that situation for long enough, you have a kind of maturity. I think it le lends itself to being more self-reflective. And if you are, you can't quite you know, go ramming into a war or life in the same way as I think those palm look. Right, you know, right. You can't have any illusions about what a military is or what a war yeah. is because right. everyone's too close to it. So in America, <laughs> I think because you have distance, most people have distance from the military. You can have certain images of what it is, but you can't in Israel. And that's why there are no military parades in Israel, and that's why the army is kind of anti-military in a weird way. And and the correct attitude in the best combat units is a kind of cynicism about about the army, which is not what you'd what you'd expect. I think it, just going from the you know, from the images that Israel has always tried to to project, because the reality is, of course, very different. Yeah. Um, but let me ask you one or two questions <laughs> before you go. Um, if you know, maybe we'll just start. I'll, I'll get you to read that sure. section we were talking about, and yeah. then I'll explain sure. why. Um, Monty has assigned me a reading. Some reading. I think we should say that this is the first time. This is a pretty. Um, I mean, I have. I've read the book, so I feel special. Ma Mati is in the book, actually. I didn't want to say that, but um, <laughs> this is, I think, we can call it the premiere of, of Forrest Stark, right. um, which mm. is, I'll just plug it a bit. I mean, <laughs> it's just an absolutely wonderful, um, surprising book that I think you'll love, but I won't oversell it. It doesn't need to be oversold. So. OK. Um, so I'm going to read that <laughs> section you asked me to read, but well, wait. It is, yes, here. So this is a, a section where uh, a character, one of the main characters, whose name is Jules, Jules Epstein, he's American, and he has, um, his parents have died, and he's divorced from his wife of 35 years, and he's gone to Israel with this sort of vague idea of um, doing something in his parents' memory. Um, he's staying at the Hilton Hotel, and he has this idea that he's going to go out and have a swim. So he's standing there on the shore. Behind him was the city where he had been born. However far his life had unspooled from it, he had come, oh, I forgot to say he was born in Israel. There you go. However far his life had unspooled from it, he had come from here. The sun and breeze were his native conditions. His parents had come from nowhere. Where they came from had ceased to exist and so could not be returned to. But he himself came from someplace. Less than 10 minutes walk away was the corner of Zamenhof and Shlomo Hamelak streets, where he had arrived in the world in such a hurry that his mother didn't have enough time to get to the hospital. A woman had come down from her balcony, pulled him out, and wrapped him in a dishcloth. She had no children herself, but had grown up on a farm in Romania, where she had seen the births of cows and dogs. Afterward, his mother went to visit her once a week and would sit drinking coffee and smoking in her tiny kitchen while the woman, Mrs. Chernovich, bumped Epstein up and down on her knee. She had a magical effect on him. In her lap, the irascible Epstein became instantly calm. When they moved to America, his mother had lost touch with her, but in 1967, when Epstein returned to Tel Aviv for the first time just after the war, He'd gone straight to the corner where he had emerged into the world, walked across the street, and rang the buzzer. Mrs. Chernovich looked down over the railing of the balcony where she'd been watching the world go by all those years. The moment he entered her tiny kitchen and sat down at her table, he'd felt the strange sensation that he thought other people must call peace. You should have asked to buy the table, an eight-year-old Maya had famously said 
when he told the story. So in that segment, we have this character, Epstein, who's, a, who's basically a, a creature of this island. Um, and he um, is nonetheless drawn back to, the, to, to Tel Aviv, to a specific spot in Tel Aviv, and to the table of this woman. And he thinks that maybe the table is a place where he finds peace and maybe it has to do with the table. That's what his daughter, Maya, suggests. Um, what's your connection to, mm-hmm. to Israel and to Tel Aviv? Mm-hmm. I think that, that that scene does draw um, something of the real line of my relationship with the place, which is equally a sense of um, being stuck between here and there. I think because um, so many important things in my family happened in Israel because my grandparents met there, my parents met there, and my father spent his childhood in Tel Aviv. Um, And because we were going to Israel our whole lives as kids growing up, I always had a sense of that place being um, sort of equally real and live to me, if not more so than this one. And in a sense, more so, because whenever we would go there, there would be this collective sigh of relief in my family of like, Oh, right, this landscape, like this is kind of where we belong, but we're just kind of like gonna, <laughs> I think, you know, that sense of like America is a good place to kind of like make it, but Israel is a, the place where you belong. And I think my family was always American in the sense that, you know, my grandfather came here, we were immigrants, and this became a place to succeed. And But it was never, I think, a place that we were taught to be particularly attached to, not to its history or anything else. And we would always return, so to speak, to Israel. And I think that for me, that was a complicated thing growing up. I wasn't sure what to make of that. Um, my grandparents uh, on one side made Aliyah and lived in Jerusalem for you know the last 25 years of their lives. So I would go back and I would stay with them. And I think I'd, there was just this sense as I got older and older of why is it that I feel something of my true self is here? Or why am I so engaged by this place in a way that I'm not actually engaged um, with the culture around me in America. And then as I became a writer, that became even more acute, which is to say that I felt in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, that when I would overhear stories, I could tell them. I knew how those stories went, and I knew who those characters were. Not always exactly. There are certainly huge strands and swaths of Israeli society that I don't know, and I am a foreigner there. But there's something in the soul of the place that is instinctive to me. and. It's not the same in America. I've never really no, I don't understand what it is to be an American writer because the place is just so huge. Like, where do you begin? <laughs> you know, I mean, what, what is your what is you know? I guess there, there are writers who choose pockets of it, and in a sense, I could do that. But even um, even in that sense, New York doesn't draw me in the same way that Israel does. And so it is the sense of returning to some place that has a mysterious hold on me. Which is interesting because you're from here and you've never lived in Israel, right? Yeah, no, I've only ever spent periods there and I'm not sure how it would be to live there for me to be honest I really love the position of both and I think it's the ideal position because I mean despite you know like a sort of near fist fight on stage with Yehoshua that I had in Jerusalem about this sort of argument he has which is you cannot be Israeli novelist right right um and and I um bully as he's called in Israel which is fits him well. Bully really has this notion that you can't, you could not be a Jewish writer now unless you live in Israel, that the story to be told in Israel and you're sort of wasting your time unless you're there. And I really, we had a large argument about that largely because I do feel like actually that, you know, the diaspora is a very good place to be. I mean, it is after all the place where we became Jews, frankly, like it is the place, Babylon was the place where the Torah got largely written and like, you know, the sense of how we define ourselves happened outside of Israel. Um, So there's that thought. And then there's the other thought, which you once said to me years ago, and which always lodged in my head, and we were having a conversation, you said, yeah, but think about it, like 500 years from now, when like in in this particular section of Jewish history, do you think America is going to matter at all? No, like the real Jewish story that's happening now is Israel. And I hear that too. And so I, f- I feel like there's something really wonderful about being in both worlds for me and being able to go back and forth and being able to send my characters back and forth. I've noticed the progression in your writing. I mean, your, your first two books are very much here. And um, in Great House, which I was 
recently rereading, and I was reminded how, um, how amazing it is. The, the book opens with a novelist who is here, and uh, her life is upended by the appearance of a young woman from Jerusalem, and the novel ends up increasingly being drawn into the world of Israel, and there's a character who's an Israeli man. Um, of course, this book, Forrest Dark, takes place mostly in Israel. It, certainly, the, the weight of the book is, is in Israel. Uh, maybe I'll get you to read that second sure. uh, section where you talk about visitors, visitors to Israel. Yeah. Um, OK, let me see where this one starts. Um, so this is a section of the book where it's towards the end, and Epstein has now been in Tel Aviv for quite a while, and he's sort of deciding to stay more permanently. Um, and he's sort of under a kind of spell, in a sense, a spell. He's come unmoored, right? He's Epstein's come unmoored. life in Manhattan, which is, he's kind of a Jewish hurricane, a character <laughs> right. who I think would be familiar to many here. <laughs> and he, everything comes unstuck, and he comes into the orbit of this different this different place. This different place, and he's sort of, he's looking for an apartment, um, and uh, this agent takes him to this place in Jaffa, this real estate agent, and um, this is sort of the, from the perspective of the real estate agent. Um, he's talking about Americans who come to Israel and fall in love with it. For a week, they fall in love with the urgency and the argument and the warmth, with the way everyone sits in the cafes and talks and gets into each other's lives. The way that even on the outside, is, even if on the outside Israel is obsessed with borders, on the inside it lives without boundaries. How there's no disease of loneliness here, and every taxi driver is a prophet, and every salesman of the shook will tell you the story of his brother and his wife. And the next thing you know, the guy behind you in line is chiming in too, and soon the, enough the crummy quality of the towels doesn't matter anymore, because the stories and the mess and the craziness, all that life, it's just so much more essential. They come to Tel Aviv and find it so sexy, the sea and the strength, the nearness to violence and the hunger for life, and how even if Israelis are living in an existential crisis all the time and sense their country is lost, at least they live in a world where everything still matters and is worth fighting for. Most of all, they fall in love with how they feel here. This is where we come from, they think, as they duck through the tunnels under the western wall sling through the tunnels dug by Bar Kokhba, scale Masada, stand in Levantine sunlight, hike the Judean camp in the Negev, come to the Kinneret, where the children that could have been their own grow up wild and barefoot, and related to the past mostly through acts of discontinuity. It's this that we didn't know we missed. But the agent knew well that after a week or two they start to feel differently, these Americans. The strength starts to stink of aggression, and the directness becomes pushy. It begins to grate how Israelis don't have any manners, how they have no respect for personal space, no respect for anything. And doesn't anyone do anything in Tel Aviv aside from sit around talking and going to the beach? The city is really a shithole, isn't it? Everything that isn't new is falling apart. The whole place smells of cat piss. There's a sewage problem right under the window, and no one can come for a week. And actually, Israelis are impossible to deal with, so stubborn and intractable so frustratingly immune to logic, so damn rude, and it turns out most of them don't care for anything Jewish. Their grandparents and parents ran as far away as they could, and the ones that do care, they're over the top, those settlers, totally out of their minds, and frankly, the whole country is a bunch of Arab-hating racists. And so just in the nick of time, before they put down the deposit on a two-bedroom in the new glass high-rise going up over Nevetsedek, it's back in the cab to the airport with their suitcases fragrant with zatar and laden with silver Judaica from Hatzafarim and their Lexus keys newly hung on a hamsa. The Lexus keys hung on a hamsa. That's... <laughs> I'm going to swallow the insult about the towels and just note the um, razor sharp observations which you do like no one, like um, no one else. Um, mm -hmm. So you seem to be increasingly in the in the orbit of this place, right? You're not mm -hmm. there. You're still mm -hmm. here, but you're writing keeps bringing you back, kind of like a satellite, getting closer and closer. So you're at least, you know, looking at the books you've written so far, you're just getting closer and closer to this, to this place. What's, what's going on? What is it? <laughs> what? Um, I was just thinking, like, I'm, I'm gonna, like, where am I going to go next after this? Because I think I've gone as far as I can go. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, it's something, I think that, Israel plays a particular role in this book because it's about two American characters 
um, whose stories are sort of run parallel but never touch. And they are both sort of, they both sort of come to the end of one way of living and are, are open to transformation. They're going through a kind of metamorphosis, I suppose. And I think that Israel awakens some energy in them or some possibility, some liveness, some spirituality, um, as it did for me, frankly, as it does for me still. Um, but you know, I think one, one of the conversations we often have is about this, in a sense, like as writers, how Israel offers us both. Um, because even if you live there, you, are st you still have this perspective of a writer, you know, this, um, how it offers us this fascinating story of the society that is so much in flux. Um, and one of the really beautiful things I think you did in your book is sort of like pinpoint um, this whole period of this of um, the like the security zone in Lebanon and the time of the pumpkin with this kind of turning point in um, in Israeli understanding of itself. And I wonder if you could read a section, um, the one that we talked about on page one eighty eight, um, where you sort of. Um, get right to the heart of this idea. I wasn't done with my questions for you. But Sorry, I'll... buddy. That was neatly done. Um, Thank you. So this is kind of a consideration of the, of the importance of, of the period, and in part, the book is an attempt to write about the 90s, which it didn't really occur to me that I was doing that when I was, when I was writing it, but looking back, it's, it's about the 90s, and the music is the music of the 90s, and the events are events that happened in the 90s, and the 90s is a decade that still isn't taken seriously as history, because it's not history, it's just the 90s, it's the Spice Girls, you know what I mean? It's Ace of Base, but the 90s set up the, the present, and, um, and they're worth some thought. Uh, the Israel that arrived in Lebanon in 1982, which is the year of the invasion of Lebanon, was still imaginative and light on its feet, however unwise its ideas and however wretched their execution. The point is that we thought we could make things happen. The invasion was supposed to affect a dramatic change in our surroundings, just as in the 90s, the years of this narrative, many of us believed that such a change would be engineered not by force, but by compromise. Underlying these very different enterprises was the same sentiment. Our fate was malleable, and it was ours to shape. But most of us came to understand in the year of the pumpkin's destruction, 2000, that we were wrong. We might make good choices or bad choices, but the results are unpredictable and the possibilities limited. The Middle East doesn't bend to our dictates or our hopes. It won't change for us. When these things began to be clear, something interesting occurred. People in Israel didn't despair, as our enemies hoped. Instead, they stopped paying attention. What would we gain from looking to our neighbors, only heartbreak, and a slow descent after them into the pit? No, we would turn our back on them and look elsewhere to the film festivals of Berlin and Copenhagen or the tech parks of California. Our happiness would no longer depend on the moods of people who wish us ill, and their happiness wouldn't concern us more than ours concerns them. Something important in the mind of the country, an old utopian optimism was laid to rest. At the same time, we were liberated, most of us, from the curse of existing as characters in a mythic drama, from the hallucination that our lives are enactments of the great moral problems of humanity, that people in Israel are anything other than people, hauling their biology from home to work, and trying to eke out the usual human pleasures in an unfortunate region and an abnormal history. It's beautiful. Um, I think in a more prosaic um, description of that would just be like driving from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, <laughs> right? I mean, I don't feel like that was my experience of just like for years I would go to Jerusalem and I felt the heaviness and the thousands of years of history and the conflict and then I sort of discovered Tel Aviv and everyone was just at the beach and like doing startups and you know making art and I think but that there I think that the fact of the matter is that you embodied that I mean you came to Israel at that time that if we can locate it then I mean it's hard to know exactly when that began to happen but probably around then it's kind of extraordinary and yet at the same time I think um, Israel can only ever be both right it can only ever it, as much as it throws itself into the casualness of daily life, it will always also be 
um, sort of this place that is elevated by its um, an aware a consciousness of its circumstances. Um, there's a, there, in your book, you describe the, the moment, um, the turning point um, sort of militarily where the, there's this helicopter crash. That was in 1997, right? And 73 soldiers, so two, maybe you want to just describe that a little for people. Who haven't sure, the, the turning point of the period and a, a huge moment for me personally and for Israelis of my generation was the collision of two transport helicopters in northern Israel at the beginning of February 1997, and many of you probably remember, and there were two uh, big helicopters with 73 people on board um, headed up to two outposts in the security zone, Beaufort Castle and Outpost Pumpkin, which were uh, close to each other, and as they were headed north, the, the, the choppers crashed into each other and everyone was killed. Um, the that event had national including importance. Avi, who's in right, 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 and that's um, that's how I found him right. essentially because yeah. um, he was one of the seventy three. The that event has national significance, of course, because immediately after that crash, the, uh, a protest movement starts the Four Mothers Movement, which is mothers of military age kids who decide that this Lebanon war is a waste of life and it's not protecting. Um, the border, it's actually costing more lives than it's saving, and if the army's not gonna get everyone out of Lebanon, they're gonna do it. And in a very Israeli way, they just start phoning people, and they know people in parliament, and they get organized, and they make a nuisance of themselves until public sentiment shifts, and the army ends up pulling out of Lebanon, and my company blows up Outpost Pumpkin in the spring of 2000. But on a personal level, that crash, in in retrospect, I didn't fully understand it at the time, but the shadow of that crash, the shadow of those helicopters, was my entire military service. Mm -hmm. So I was drafted in the summer of 1997, about six months, I guess, after the, the, the helicopters crashed. And our platoon leader, a guy named Har'el, was, um, um, uh, he, he'd been sent to officer's training, and a few days after he left his platoon, for the officer's base in the south, everyone got on the helicopter uh, up to Lebanon and everyone died except for him. He was the only one left from his platoon. And he went to all the funerals and then went back to officer's training, finished training, went to the training base and began to train new recruits for Lebanon and that was me. And, and there's and that my, famous and question platoon. that he gets asked, like how did you go back? Right, and he so just he, there's says, a TV right, there's and he a says TV. on the bus. Right, a TV interviewer <laughs> asked him, how did you go back to the army after that? And I think they were expecting an ideological answer. They're expecting, you know, that Israel, you know, Zionism, religion, something lofty. And Harel, you see him in the interview, he just, he might, he has no expression on his face, maybe just like a glimmer of disdain in one eye. And he says, on the bus. Baltus. And that really reflects, I think, that generation that I kind of found myself part of when I, when I moved there. They weren't into the, the lofty expression of ideals. They scoffed at that kind of talk, even if they embodied ideals in their actions. Mm. So El went back to Lebanon, which is pretty amazing. But he would never admit that he was doing it for idealistic reasons. He went back on the bus. Mm. Um, that was, those were the people who I met. Um, and it was all very much in the shadow of, of the crash. And my army service ended up being from the crash until the withdrawal. So I was actually sent to Lebanon just as the whole Lebanon enterprise begins to disintegrate. And then you, dis you further describe the success of the Four Mothers Movement as sort of the last time that you can point to when the sort of like left was an ascent and that after that, that whole um, arm of Israeli society, that kibbutznik left wing, no, no longer has any play on, you know, or any effect on sort of national policy, that it's the, the last gasp of that. Right, I mean, I say that with, um, you know, sorrow as someone who's yeah. uh, very much nostalgic for that Israeli left yeah. and very much part of the, of the left in Israel, but the, the 90s, um, there was a kind of thinking in the 90s, and it was reflected in the peace process, which was, of course, the story that everyone was paying attention to in the 90s. This stuff, the Lebanon thing, was in the back of people's minds. In retrospect, this was much more important. But everyone thought that there was a peace, that peace was coming, that there was gonna be a mm. new Middle East, and the people leading it were people from that Israel. 
Um, Ehud Barak, of course, was a kibbutznik, and Rabin was associated with the Palmach and the kibbutz movement, and these were, and the four mothers, and these were all people from that Israel. And in, in retrospect, the success of the four mothers movement, which succeeds in convincing people that the thing to do in Lebanon is to get out, not to keep fighting Hezbollah, not to hit them harder, but to get out of Lebanon, um, and which the army does in the spring of 2000, just a few months before everything collapses. The peace mm. process collapses, and the most left-wing government we'd ever elected was on the receiving end of the worst wave of terrorism that we'd ever seen, and, um, and the left is discredited, and in many ways has never, has never recovered. Yeah, um, and, and they, they succeed in doing that largely by um, convincing Sort of Israel to look at these soldiers as children, like that whole notion of like the, for you describe it sometimes like the the mother, the picture of the mothers pushing the strollers, but they have the um, tank tracks underneath, like this idea that you're pushing your babies sort of into war, um, and I think that is something that has sort of remained that sense of. Um, the soldiers as the you know the country's children, which of course again when you go back to 1948, there was like no no notion of that at all. Um, and I guess I sort of am tempted to ask a question. We're both parents of kids that are the same age, and I'm, I can't help but ask like, given your experience and that, like how do you do, how do you think about your own kids um, who will be like in 10 years who will be in a similar position as you were? Like most Israeli parents, I don't. Hmm. <laughs> That's the that's the solution. Um, I, you know, I, I have I live on this line right between the most peaceful country on earth, basically, which is Canada, and um, and the place where I live. And of course, Israel poses dangers to the people who, who live in it, but it also offers so much. It offers them so much, and I'm happy. I have four kids, and their mother tongue is Hebrew. They don't think that's weird. They don't understand that 100 years ago, no one spoke that language. They just think it's a language that everyone speaks. They've never been out of Israel. Mm-hmm. They, we, we live in Jerusalem, so sometimes they ask about, you know, they'll see a church, and we talk about Christianity, and they think Christianity is some obscure sect. You know, they think it's like the Druze, like people who we're responsible for, Christians. And their whole, this is their whole world. This we kind are, of, but... Yeah, this whole, like, this whole <laughs> unlikely story of... A people who are, you know, on the ropes and bounce back in the most incredible way, and being part of that story, which gives us, you know, so much every day, has a price, and it's a pretty steep one. Um, but I wouldn't want it every any other way. And I've never, you know, since leaving Canada when I was 17, I've never considered going back. Um, speaking of the weight, <laughs> the weight that. Uh, Judaism, or Jewish life, or Jewish history. Nice segue. Uh, thank you. <laughs> this is something that I've, it's, it's nice to have Nicole here. She can't run away. She just, you have to answer my questions about your writing now, because you have nowhere to go. Um, the, um, there's this idea that, that recurs in, in your writing that Jewish history or Jewish life is placing a weight on you, and you're trying to evade it. Um, there's a character in this, in this book, Forrest Ark, whose name is Friedman, not me, another Friedman who um, is, contacts the main character who's a novelist, and, and I guess he must be in his 60s, something like that, and he, older, I guess. or maybe even older, and he represents, he speaks in the first person plural. So he wants something from the main character, um, and he speaks in the name of we, we need you for this. This is what we need now. Um, and, and, and the main character kind of rebels against this. Who's this? <laughs> we? Who are you? you know, what is this collective that demands something of me? There was a headline in Haaretz after Great House came out that, uh, that I wrote down just because it's a, first of all, it's a <laughs> terrible headline. Um, but uh, the, the headline of the review in Haaretz of Great House, which, which had um, had a lot of readers in Hebrew as well. Um, it was Nicole Krauss rebels against the duty of loyalty to Jewish history, and uh, that really put kind of it really puts a finger on something that I hadn't thought about, which is this weight that your characters seem to be dragging around, and they couldn't exist without it, obviously, but they hate it and they want to escape, and they're in Jerusalem, but they want Tel Aviv, and even when it's Tel Aviv, it it you know pursues them. And I found this quote which I'm going to read tackily on my cell phone uh, <laughs> just because I had nowhere to print it out, but I couldn't resist reading it. Here, it's from a short story called Zusia on the Roof, which is a story that you know that I love. 
Um, it's about a character, a kind of Epstein, maybe a cousin, maybe Epstein's right. cousin or yeah. a, a second precursor, cousin, yeah. a precursor. Um, he is sick and he, he's, be, he's taking medication and he's kind of hallucinating. And, and from this feverish state of mind, um, he held counsel with Buber, Rabbi Akiva, and Gershom Shalom, who relaxed on a bearskin rug, scratching behind its ears. He sat with Maimonides in the back of a bulletproof car. There was no end to the talking. He saw Moses, even Ezra, and heard Salo Baron, to whom he called, waving his arms to disperse the smoke. He couldn't see him, but knew he was in that swirling nebula, breathing heavily. Salo Whitmare Baron, who knew 20 languages and had testified at Eichmann's trial, the first man to receive a chair in Jewish history at a university in the Western world. Salo, what have you brought on us? Enormous things happened to him during those feverish weeks, unspeakable revelations. Unbuttoned from time, transient and transcendental, Broadman, that's the character, saw the true shape of his life, how it had torqued always in the direction of duty. Not only his life, but the life of his people, the 3,000 years of treacherous remembering, highly regarded suffering and waiting. So it's your, you know, your mind, it's not like Archie Comics, you know, the mind of Nicole Krauss. Um, what, I mean, first of all, Rabbi Kiva, right, who's flayed alive by Romans, and you got Eichmann in there in the end, just in case anyone was feeling kind of cheerful. What, what is this duty that pursues you, and what are you protesting against exactly? But um, in this main character that you're referring to is actually called Nicole in Farrestock. She's a writer, and at one point, Friedman, who's trying to get her, this Nicole, to... Um, sort of sign up for this project that he has in mind for her. He might work for the Mossad, he hints, right. it's unclear. Right, he hints he's from Mossad, or he's a retired professor of Jewish literature from Tel Aviv University, we never really know. And at some point, um, Nicole says to him, like, I just, you know, I don't even know what you're asking, I can't really do this, you know, like, I just, my own work is just complicated enough as it is, and my own, like, it just, and he says, and he stops and he says to her, you think your work belongs to you? And she's like, who else? And he says, to the Jews. <laughs> and, she, and she just sort of like, you know, she laughs at him, but realizes that he's serious. And of course, it's an absurd line, but I think there is, um, there's- Is there any, there's no connection between that Nicole Krauss and this Nicole oh God, Krauss? no, couldn't be. feels the weight <laughs> of <laughs> Jewish expectation. No, well, well, there's another section that comes just before that in the book where, um, I describe I describe this Nicole. She she is very much me, like me. I don't know. It's hard to t tell the difference, but um, she's describing um, her experience of being a writer um, in Israel. And she says, so you know, basically, like in Sweden or Japan, they could like really care less about what I write. But like in Israel, they stop me in the street. And she talks about um, you know sort of being in this um, sh supermarket and this woman coming up and sort of like pinning her against the kosher yogurt spoon and saying, oh, I'm gonna read everything you write, you know, until I'm in the grave, you know. And the sort of flashes her, you know, tattoo. And then she talks about going to Yad Vashem um, on a tour with some other writers from the Jerusalem Writers Festival and being sort of taken off, like the other non-Jewish festival writers are allowed to leave, and she's taken off into the back offices um, and this really did happen to me, and like they had taken out the special papers of my family history, and my great grandparents have been in the Holocaust, and it was like the suggestion was like, you know, like we're on you, and we, like, we, we know, we know, we know who you are, and, and they in the in the novel they give Nicole this blank notebook, and she says like could this, it's like for the. 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, and they'd sort of send her home with this blank and writing that, notebook. And that happened. Right, um, close to it. Um, and, and she said, you know, like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to write in this notebook? But she's, there's just sort of joking, um, joking about the ways in which it is both wonderful to be embraced by your people as a Jewish writer, um, but also sort of ter a terrifying thing, because naturally, as a writer, one wants to write what one wants. And actually, if you would have told me, sort of growing up, um, that I would have become a writer, that would have been wonderful news to me. If you would have told me that I would be considered or called, in my mind, pigeonholed as a Jewish writer, I think it, it would have been so curious to me and totally confusing, because it just was, uh, you know, for me, writing is always about um, kind of 
breaking, breaking the system, as it were, you know. Unfortunately, the more you get into Judaism, the more you learn about it, you learn that that is in some sense the bait, like Jew Judaism is a very radical thing. It is about, in some senses, breaking the system. And there, and there, there became, for me, the more I got engaged in it, the richer it seemed to me, the deeper the argument, the more complex, and the more I felt that, it, that I really had this huge luck to be born into this. Um, to this thing that I could be in argument with. So I think it's, it's actually like a, a, a fair and, um, position to occupy, which is both to say like, um, to, both to protest against it, you know, to say like, I, I, will, I want to sort of break this and be who I, but at the same time to use it sort of in the ways that I, that I want. Has, I mean, you, your books have been read, of course, in English, but also in, in Hebrew. And you've had an, in, uh, the experience of coming to Israel, as you do quite often, and interacting with people who've read your books in Hebrew. Can you point to a difference or se mm. several differences between the way your books are read in Hebrew and the way they're read in English? Um, it's hard, that's hard to say. I do, I mean, I th I'm not sure there's any difference among Israeli Jews and American Jews. I think there is a common sense of like ownership Right, I mean the sense of like, you know, I mean the the confusion of um, a friend of mine and I were talking about how every time she writes a book, the same friend says to her, "Oh, you you put me in this book again, like I'm this character," and she's like, "You're not in the book," and it's a little bit like that, like writing a book and like all the Jews say to you, "See, you put us in the book, like it's all about us," and like, "No, no, actually, it wasn't. That's not what I meant at all," you know. Um, but I'm not sure that I, I can pinpoint any real distinction, but what I do feel is um, it surprises me like the enormous warmth with which the books are always received there. Um, and it you know, just sort of surprises me that um, people respond to them as if it were, as if I were giving them something native to them. I think that's true. I mean, the, there's always a tension when outsiders write about and, and, and any, you know, and anything that you know and that's close to you. And a lot of Israelis uh, cringe at the depictions of Israel, um, you know, created by by people who aren't there. Either they're, you know, um, you know, critical and hostile, or they're cheesy, or they're clueless. And your writing is not uh, greeted mm -hmm. in any of those ways. And people mm -hmm. kind of treat you as if you're Israeli. Right. And mm -hmm. when you're in Israel, I, and I've told, <laughs> I've said this a few times, I keep forgetting that you don't speak Hebrew, right. because your uh, grasp of the society as, you know, as uh, I think yeah. is demonstrated in that uh, segment that you read about Tel Aviv is, um, is kind of a native grasp, which is such a strange thing for someone who's never lived in the country. But I think that, that for me, that is sort of, again, like this special privilege of being between worlds in that sense, because I am, yes, when I'm in Israel, people always say the same thing to me, like, you look Israel, you should be Israel, of course you're Israel, like, why don't you speak Hebrew? And then, but when I'm here, I am absolutely a New Yorker, and I think that being able to um, write from the outside about each of those things, but from the inside, at the same time, from the inside and from the outside, I think that's sort of like what's exciting to me. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't give that, that up for anything. There's, there are a few Hebrew words in the book that are very important. One of them is Gilgul, which yeah. is the name of a very convincing, I guess, how would you call it in English? A kind of Ka Kabbalah center, right. like for a place a mystical for mystical Jewish for seekers. Learning. One of these yeah. places in Israel that some of you have probably encountered. People who look for people who are seeking seekers. Uh, I mean, if you go to the Western Wall on Friday, there are people who invite you for Shabbat dinner and introduce you to Judaism, and and it's kind of that that kind of place. And Gilgul, the word, it appears in Hebrew fairly often in the book, and there are other words. Did you make a decision to introduce Hebrew into this? <laughs> Well, so um, Gilgul means, you didn't just say this, did you, did you define it for them? No. So Gilgul means, um, literally it means like a wheel or turning, but it, it refers in Jewish mysticism to like the um, transformation of the soul. It's kind of the only real Jewish reference to the afterlife or reincarnation. Um, and it belongs in that, you know, mystical, mystical cupboard where a lot of crazy but beautiful Jewish ideas live. Um, and at some point in the writing of this book, which has a lot to do with Kafka um, and a kind of crazy theory about Kafka, that's right. In case in the you book. thought the book was kind of light, in case um, <laughs> or wasn't there wasn't enough weight right. uh, in the book, Kafka, Kafka is in the book. Enter Kafka. Although and it does manage, it does manage to be 
to, to light, be light at the same time uh, somehow. But Kafka is in the book. Yeah, and it's, at some point I um, I realized or learned that um, the metamorphosis in Yiddish um, is Der Gilgul, and in Hebrew is Ha Gilgul. And to me, that's fascinating because it suggests that the Jewish reading of that story is that it is not a story about transformation of form, of physical form, but it's about the transformation of soul. And actually, um, the word that um, in, in German is for the, I mean, people think it's a cockroach. This is really vermin, right? That, that Gregor Samsa turns into this huge vermin and it's really hard to say what kind of insect it is. But that word in German is what um, Hermann, uh, Kafka's father used to refer to his Jewish friends as these vermin, you bring these vermin by again. And so there was this suggestion of like Jews as vermin. And so in this transformation of Gregor Samsa to his family's horror into this vermin, it is something about like the, the, the exposing of Jew, the Jewish soul, so to speak, right? Um, and I just thought that was really fascinating. And so the, for, for a while, part of the connection between these two parallel stories, one which is Epstein, who ends up being taken by this mystical rabbi up to his Gilgul center, and then the Nicole section, which becomes about Kafka, was in this notion of like this wheel or this transformation of the soul. There's a suggestion in the book that Kafka himself had some kind of reincarnation, and I won't say exactly what it is what yeah. it is, but not only did he write about a Gilgul, he seems to have actually Experience pulled off his own Gilgul. Yeah, and I won't say too much about that more either, beyond that people who have read Forest Chart keep telling me that they, as soon as they put the book down, they sort of, they Google, like, where did Kafka die? Like, cause it's, because there's something that is so credible about this particular idea Sorry. of Kafka's afterlife in Hebrew, which that once you read it, you think, of course, it's more, it sounds more true than the yes. real story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.